Okay. Yep. We have a quorum. I uh, will call the meeting to order. Uh, first item is number one, the agenda. We're looking for adoption of the agenda as presented. I'll uh, so move. Second. Moved by Mr. Valentine. Second by Ms. Fish. Mm -hmm. um, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Unanimous. Uh, no public comment tonight. Oh. Uh, item number three, draft minutes of the September 24th meeting. This is the action item. Any comments? I don't have any. Looks good to me. Mm -hmm. So again, I would uh, seek a motion to approve. Approve. Motion to approve. I'll second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Unanimous, thank you. Uh, item number three, uh, draft minutes, excuse me, item number three, item number four, draft minutes of the October 8th board meeting. Comments from the commission? She's still staying on the board okay. for the remainder of the term, but she decided to step down for personal reasons. And since I was the vice president, um, I will try to fill her shoes. For the, the Thank right. you. So two more meetings to go for me, and then we'll elect the president. Not, not that you're counting yeah. down. <laughs> <laughs> Private rentals, uh, rules and procedures follow up. Um, and had time to review what we did. Uh, mm -hmm. Luke submitted. Um, any questions or comments from the commission about this? How do you feel about it? Um, <coughs> uh, good. I actually really um, found the last meeting. Sorry, Shane, that you, that you missed it, but um, I would have loved to hear some of your feedback from that. But, uh, it was uh, extremely helpful to hear uh, the commission's thoughts and opinions on, on the subject of, of private rentals of the community center. Mm -hmm. um, I thought that we came away from that meeting with a pretty clear idea of um, sort of what the feelings were and um, helped staff on our end uh, kind of clarify sort of the direction that probably we want to move <coughs> in. And so without making any major overhaul changes to our um, procedures, we have made some uh, changes to, to how we operate, and I've highlighted those with the, the bullet points listed in the memo, mm -hmm. um, to kind of help cut down on some of the negative uh, elements of the building rentals that we were addressing last meeting. And um, I, I feel really comfortable with these, and would be happy to hear any um, feedback that the, com that the commission has. But. I guess I would ask um, the, the last bullet item, so security, can you kind of define what activity warrants additional security, I guess? Um, that, that's a great question, John. I think the, the whole goal of a lot of these, um, the previous bullet points are hopefully to um, keep us from having to go to that level of severity with, with um, keeping the, the rentals calm and under control and everything. So. Um, I think it would come if, if there was a certain uh, event that was reaching, you know, a certain capacity and the activities involved and what the, the nature of it was and the, the age group um, may, may elicit that, but we're hoping not to go there. This would be the, um, but that's something that we keep in our mm -hmm. policy that we could implement if, if it seemed like something that really warranted So that. you'll look at it on a case by case Exactly. Basis. Yeah, well, under the discretion of the department. So. Is that additional fee then to the... It would be, uh, the renter would, would cover the full cost of 
hiring um, said security company to be present at the rental so they would incur all costs of, of that requirement. Do you have a security uh, company in mind? Does you like the vibe of it? Do you think it's We have a it? few companies that uh, uh, other recreation departments use regularly we talk to. Um, and so I haven't set up an official Agreement or you know with them, but there's there's a few that have been uh, considered reputable that we have we can reach out to if it comes to needing to set up a contract or something or a, at least establish a you know, relationship with. Okay. Okay. One, one thought I had about uh, you know factors to take into consideration is if the event is going to require alcohol. That's something that might be a, I don't know if that's allowed. <coughs> allowed or for parties that are going to go. You know, Saturday night party that goes until 11 with hard liquor, it's a little bit different than the party that goes, in, you know, with Sunday. wine and beer. Yeah. Uh, right. We definitely have not differentiated between uh, between that. One thing, the um, so we do ask, you know, if alcohol's being served or if it's being being sold, like it's some sort of fundraiser situation. Right. They indicate that is that they get a permit for that. But if it's being served. Um, we do we do know that I we don't have um, anything differentiating between what types of alcohol the yeah so that's something that we, not we, to we just when you write it in but if it just you know it becomes evident that a full bar is going to be part of the event that sometimes can you yeah, know, open bar yeah, things uh, get well, a little bit more out of hand than with white beer not always but you know yeah absolutely that play into it, so. that's something we can, can, can consider for sure. Um, this is not anything that we need to approve on, so it's just, it's just a, I always just read it, it's a follow-up. Yeah, it's a follow-up. It was a, it was a, to Luke's point, I want to echo it, it was a really good conversation last time, and obviously staff has spent a lot of time on this, myself included, but primarily uh, Robin and Luke and Carolyn and a lot of late work and research and time that they've put into it and really looking at what other agencies, primarily cities, are doing in this regard because um, there's only so many CSD or smaller districts like ours uh, and just and looking at what they had even on the security side and I would say John you know as we were looking at these a lot of it was very very ambiguous in terms of the city may or the town might require it didn't none of them really seem to have a set list of if you are you know, like they didn't have an ABC test per se. Yeah. Boxes. Uh, yeah, then you have to have security. I mean, it left it for them to have the option of doing it, which to a lot of areas I understand concern with that, but I also can understand some level of agreement and discretion with that as well. And uh, that certainly also seemed to be a little bit of a concern that I think the commission shared last time was, well, I don't know if I want every event to have to have, you know, a, a uniformed uh, person walking around either is that uh, what kind of tone does that set right off the bat too so it was you know we heard but wanted to keep that as a uh, option for events if we felt it, it might be needed or beneficial yeah and one thing with uh, just some of the, the bullet points here is for some of the um, elements of the problems that we've had over the years um, generally end of the night so that was one reason to, to push um, earlier by one hour is that the thing, you know, between 11, 10 and 11, 11 and 12, during the cleanup or whatever, I just wanted to see most of the instance where I would get a call and, you know, got a problem going on or something. So um, that's going to, I think, help a lot in terms of one less hour of, of the uh, party goers drinking and, and whatnot. Um, and also looking at the duration of the event, um, eight hours as opposed to some of the events, we, you know, we have these 12 hour, 13 hour, 14 hour events where um, just that much longer as of being that much more extravagant of an event, that, that much more time for people to, you know, um, doing, doing whatever activities. And so um, I think this will sort of, um, the events that, that would be within these confines will, will just probably be a little bit mellower and a little bit more, um, you know, under control. So just in, in general. But. I think you guys did a really good job on strengthening the language regarding the last hour of it as well. That yeah. you know uh, the event is over at ten. This last hour is strictly for cleanup. Your guests need to have vacated by that time. Right. Uh, they they they, they made that much more clear in the application process this time too. So I think that will help letting them know that at ten your event's over. 
you get this extra hour strictly for cleanup purposes, not, well, you can keep the event going, just clean up there. You know, it was a little less, a little more pay, I guess, in the previous versions. So two questions just from a logist, I guess from an implementation standpoint, is this something that needs to, curious, this might be three questions actually, is this something that is, um, has the board has to approve or is this just a staff decision and it's a notification of the board at the next meeting, A. B, if, when did it start, if it didn't already start, and then C, are events already booked grandfathered? Uh, I'd say the answer is yes to all three. Um, the, if the board uh, decides to, um, or correct me if I'm wrong, um, you know, review any aspect of this or implement a policy or want to review business on the metal, something that definitely can come up at the next board meeting or, or after that. Um, these changes are currently re reflected in our, in our current building contract and we've been taking reservations um, under the current situation. So. And it's a grandfather for people who booked last year? Anyone that was currently on the calendar um, is uh, being held to the standard in the contract that they signed. Right. Um, and, and we review those. We've actually gone through the entire calendar once we started looking at the, the rentals in, in general. But we looked at all the, the already booked events. Yeah. And if any of them um, seemed like we needed more information or was needed that, <coughs> we've actually contacted some of the renters and asked to do a walkthrough and, and explain the rules and regulations. So we've most of them, um, you know, are, are ones we're, we're not concerned on the ones that we thought were going to be a, a bigger party or one that you know might need more scrutiny. We've um, asked renters to come in before the event, come do a walkthrough with us, right. and we've we've given the building attendant a little more of a prep and everything. Right. Like that, so. Awesome. Did they have a fee if they're not out on that? Because this is great how you say that the whoever signs the contract has to be there for checking out. Oh, it's beautiful. I love that. Yeah, they well, they charge the fee if they're not out on time because that really holds that person yeah, accountable to get their party out. They pay a security the deposit right uh, yeah. up front that is fully refundable. Um, uh, and the and then there are stipulations in the in the contract if, if not out of the building mm -hmm. um, on time according to the contract if there's damage mm -hmm. done or you know a couple of things that um, some or all the security deposit will be will be held. Um, We've definitely added reasons why you might not get your full security deposit back. Um, one of them being you know if for any reason law enforcement has to uh, come for an incident. That's a reason you won't get your security deposit back if you're late. That's a reason. So we kind of bolstered that to let people know that uh, if you're expecting your security deposit back, you need to play by all of the rules and, and play properly. Uh, and then to answer your first question, uh, at this point in time, I mean, the board has the option, certainly, to request that this come before them, that this become something that they approve. Um, this isn't a policy per se, and this isn't a policy shift. I, I absolutely, 100%, if we would have stuck with the notion or the proposal of limiting this to, say, Marinwood residents only, that would have become a policy decision. This is a little bit more on the operational side. Um, Isabella can speak for the board much more than I can. I don't know that uh, beyond an update of some of the things that we've done, which I believe is certainly warranted, that it would need to come to them for a, a level of a, approval. I think this is more of a, a, a staff level thing. If we were to say, hey, no more rentals or severely limit who can rent, then you get into the creation of policy, at which point that's board. Right now, this is practice and procedure. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm, uh, I'm happy to see that the, the revised hours, I think that's a, a thing. I have always kind of considered the impact that these events had to the like the adjacent neighbors, people that are just across the road and I think that's much more of a you know magnitude compared to you know if you live mm -hmm. a couple miles away or something. Yeah. You know, I mean this is these people are hearing this every week. Right. And uh, so Anything we can do to lessen that impact is is a positive note. Absolutely. Um, That's the person that's I know we, <laughs> we talked last time about the, the revenue that these events generate, you know, and whether that was substantial enough to warrant continuing them, or, or whether it was, you know, just break even when we're you know we're leaning towards. I think uh, 
Mr. Campos' gated community was a bit strong, but uh, you know, the limited to residents. So I, I was just, I'm just still kind of curious. Did you make money doing that? The the rentals do bring in revenue, absolutely. Um, and the as to the question of how limiting the residents to or the rentals to residents only, how that would affect the um, you know fiscal impact. That, that's one of those things that's hard to answer. It's a it's an unknown, but. We assume that you know the currently the residents made up about a third of the or half, about half of the reservations and are paying less um, by about fifty percent. So you can do that math, but um, and we assume that the resident rentals would actually increase with more availability um, with you know weekends. But you know, it would be a, if we don't go that direction, it's a moot point. But um, we'd still be bringing in you know the revenue would change significantly um, in that regard. Okay, I, I get the impression last time that it was difficult for residents to get reservations, you know, a, a short, I guess maybe a short time in advance, that things are pretty much already booked up. So it was, I don't know if we could develop some kind of a, just some kind of a program or a policy to kind of accommodate local residents, whether, I, I mean, I, I don't know enough about it to even, I could, I could make a suggestion of, say, dates around holidays or the end of school year or something that there would be a, a couple of times that you could hold back on that if, if, if then the, the residents, I guess, were aware that these things were happening, that then make, make time available for people on, on, on like a shorter, yeah, that, that uh, one's play my son's birthday a year in advance or something. It, that one's tough just because, yeah, the nature of, you know, on the front end, like with camps, giving residents first dibs, you know, a lot allows for that, you know, to give, give them the, the first go at it. But that's, you know, that, that's more in advance than, um, you know, saving. And, and just on our holiday, you know, the, around the holidays, the, the dates are really popular around Christmas and Thanksgiving. Those actually do tend to be um, room of residents that book kind of these families in town that book a holiday party consistently year after year after year. So it, it's sort of already going that way by default because the people that okay, um, maybe they're, so. they're not missing out as much. As no, it, it's <laughs> it, but it is. Yeah, I mean because we book up uh, currently, you know, a year in advance. It's just if you're looking for anything on short notice, whether you're a resident or a non-resident, it's just it's unlikely you're going to find something in a week or two. Um, but yeah, without designating, you know, I think it's very complicated to, to try to do that, and we probably end up having a lot of um, empty weekends as a result of that. But yeah. okay. kind of like the Awani. Call on day 364 <laughs> before your event, and then yeah. you're guaranteed to get a spot, hopefully. Right. <laughs> Any other uh, comments? No, I think this is great. I, I do really commend. The time and effort and research that Luke and his staff put in there. I mean, it's, they did a lot of thoughtful thinking uh, to uh, the points that have been made. We were booked out so far in advance by the time this process was, I mean, we've been thinking about this for a long time. By the time they really dove into it, it was like, okay, when, when do we really start to see a noticeable break in what's already booked? So, I mean, the timing is now. We haven't even though they've stopped taking future reservations, I mean, we've been still booked almost every single week. Well, we, haven't, we haven't actually seen a break in the rentals um, right. yet. And so. that's just now kind of starting, kind of, yeah, it's off season, you're kind of got that shoulder season before the holidays. And so the implementation of this is good. And then we will have very few instances of one group being held to one process and other groups being held to a different process, even though their events might be five days apart. Right. Okay, then I guess we can move on to item number six, the Recreation and Park Maintenance Activity Report. Have like you been busy, Luke? Um, yeah, uh, this is um, this used to be a slow time uh, for us back in the, back in the, in the old days. Um, so yeah, just a, a couple highlights of the report here. Um, that we, we just had our Halloween Harvest Festival on the 11th which was, um, I think, 
I I go to our best event in recent memory, our best Halloween Harvest Festival. Um, great weather, great turnout, and um, Robin came up with some new ways for us to execute that were that worked really well. We had a pumpkin patch set up on the grass where kids could go out and select their pumpkin and then bring it in to carve it or decorate it, and which ended up being really popular. And uh, we were a little worried about running out of pumpkins with so many people show up this time, and it was a really really fun. We great staff uh, we were able to, to get to come work and it, it went really well. So we're very happy about that. Um, it was a fun way to kind of go into fall. And, um, and then we have our art show this Saturday, uh, our fall art show. And uh, that's, I'm looking forward to that. These shows have been a really great um, addition to our, our regular offering. <coughs> we tend to get a different uh, demographic that comes into our community center and takes part and, and we get um, these kind of put the arts on display in a, in a way that we don't want some of our other events. It's really a fun, um, a really fun event. So I hope you guys are able to come out. Um, Susan Press has, has been organizing these for us and she's plugged into the Marine Art Community and they've got a theme this time called Home. So I'm feeling artists can be expressing what home means to them through through their artwork, and um, it's, it'll be really uh, it'll be a really good time. So we're going to be setting up for that all week, and um, that's that's the next thing. And then after that, will be will be our, our winter fest. I think is the next one. But so we've been basically kind of getting everything uh, logistically prepared for all of that. Uh, the pool's closed, so um, we're very happy uh, to have a, a incident free season, and the season went really well. And it's always a huge relief, and I know that at least a couple of staff uh, sleep a lot better after October 11th, and we'll, you know, one, one less thing to be thinking about and worrying about. So uh, we're very happy with how the season went. We'll have the um, you know the pool season and the summer camp and all the um, kind of our, our overall big picture of, of the financials and everything at the next board meeting uh, to share. And so, um, but uh, overall, we're very happy with, with how things went uh, with all of that. Um, on the maintenance side of things, the uh, the big projects coming up are just kind of getting everything winterized, and we'll be going on our annual Big Creek Walk tomorrow uh, to just address you know those areas, the trees that have fallen, um, debris that's piled up, and things that are potentially going to cause a problem. And we'll be able to uh, deal with all that before the, the rain comes. Still looking at all the bee ditches and culverts. And making sure things are cleared and, and ready for um, you know some some major water, and so that that's uh, coming up in the next week or so, and we will be um, conducting interviews very soon for Victor's replacement. We have um, a handful of applicants for that position that I'm hoping that we have some some someone that will be um, a solid candidate. So. We'll have information about that the next uh, go around, probably the board meeting. But are there any questions about uh, anything? That position is on our website also? It is, yeah. So I got it out on CPRS. It's mm -hmm. Yeah, we've got a list of a bunch of, yeah, kind of, we did the full gamut of um, different places to advertise. But. Mm -hmm. I have a question. When the Jelani's bulbing out these corners now, you know, to make the crosswalks, and it looks like there's a landscape component, maybe just a big square of dirt, but does that fall to you to maintain? Can I comment on this? Uh, interesting that you bring that up because when they did these originally a couple years ago and they made the first ones and they said, hey, you know, we're looking for some feedback on what type of landscaping, I said, well, don't, you know, if the expectation is that we are going to maintain it, then I would say you need to do something very minimal there. We outsource this and any change in contract or what we ask them to do. Um, so while I don't want it to necessarily, from an aesthetic standpoint, want it to just be an ode of concrete down there, uh, whatever you do there it needs to be easily uh, and efficiently and cost effectively maintainable. Um, that, that is a large, here's the funny part is the county always seems to come to us with concerns about any level of growth in those medians, but when they started chopping the medians up, they certainly didn't come and say, hey, we need you guys to issue a permit so we can chop these medians up. The county owns those medians. Um, it's all part of the public right-of-way, the, the road right-of-way, the roadways. That is 100% under the county jurisdiction. Uh, many years ago, well before uh, 
uh, any of us is when the district started maintaining primarily that Miller Creek uh, median because it fronted the park and you know really gave a uh, kind of naturally helped with the aesthetics of the park. Um, that has since grown into some of these other smaller medians that now we've been maintaining, like the one on Sequera, um, just right up here off of Lucas Valley, um, to some degree the one on Blackstone. Mm -hmm. um, one that we don't touch is the median between Marinwood Avenue and Las Colinas with the big red eucalyptus trees that are in there. Um, and I actually gave a lot of pushback to the county a couple of years ago when they said, hey, we got a call, can you guys have somebody come in and trim these? And that's when I said, yeah, no, you know, and they agreed and came back out and they brought somebody to do one half because PG&E goes and pillages the other half where the power lines run of those. Uh, the one that was really written into us was when Lucas Valley Estates was annexed. And those fronting berms along Lucas Valley Road are clearly ours, but these ones that sit in the middle of the roadway just are this gray area, and the county's happy to let us continue to maintain right. them, but are also happy to uh, make sure that uh, this is still our right of way, and if we need to chop these things down to make safer sidewalks, that's 100% what we're going to do, and that's 100% what they've done. Are they irrigated? You got yeah. some rocks? Plastic? Rocks? <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> because there's actually really, I mean, those are going to have a large visual impact on the area around the uh, main park land. Well, I'll be, they've been very communicative, and John, you bring up a good point of something for me to follow up with who's been our primary contact for this. I've been looking at it more from a safety perspective, and I certainly chimed in with them on large concerns that we had with this crosswalk immediately in front, and how many very, very close calls we have all yeah. witnessed happening right there, people trying to cross the street, yeah. and motorists not seeing them, as well as signage for the emergency vehicles entering and exiting that area there. Yeah. Um, but I, you bring up a very good point. I will certainly follow up with, you know, what's your uh, uh, landscape plan for these new bulb outs, if anything. And it certainly seems like they're taking a slightly different approach, at least what I've noticed on this one immediately in front, is that they have a big long ramp that goes, rather than just one big bulb with a little, uh, your typical kind of uh, oval ramp right there, it's a long, narrow ramp leading all the way back to the primary sidewalk. So I'm not sure if that's the future plans of what those are. Right. Uh, last time they did this, they definitely asked us about our thoughts of on the landscaping part, at which part I said, well, if your expectation is we're going to maintain it, then I'd say you need to do very minimal cost-effective landscaping. Because uh, technically, that's not our responsibility. This isn't our property. This is your right away. Um, we just maintain it because nobody else was. Right. And, the, and it reflects poorly on our property. Yeah. I mean, isn't the sidewalk part in front of someone's house theirs? Yeah, that's their, That's the county's take. That's the California streets and highways. Right. right. I mean, I remember that growing up in Long the same thing. Like, that yeah. That strip of what we had grass mm -hmm. was ours, even though it wasn't ours, you know? Right. But, mm -hmm. yeah. In the city, it's, there's really a popular push towards greening these bull belts. And creating a certain aesthetic, so. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm not necessarily suggesting we do that, but to that scale, well, it's expensive, there. but I think there's an opportunity if we can beautify these at all, because they're going to have a visual impact. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. So, the one on Idlebury and Miller Creek is huge. Yeah. I mean, that ball about is like... I'm really surprised. It's like that a half a football game. I don't understand why they're putting it on that side as opposed to the other side, oh, okay. and uh, I was making me wonder if they were looking to move the sidewalk to the other side of that, which makes zero sense to me because you have an additional turn lane and right, much more traffic on the path to the school. The, oh, right, yeah, the other one lines up right with the path to the school. You have fewer traffic, you know, less people kind of come in. You don't have the incidents of the cars turning right off of Idleberry heading towards Lucas Valley Road. Um, I was very surprised that, that, you know, I'm not an engineer. I'm yeah. sure that they have these, engineers. These, um, Larger bulb outs um, de facto slow the traffic down. Uh, yes. And that's that's the reason right. why they. Because they got to shrink Idleberry this way, mm -hmm. also. Yeah. Doing that when you turn it, so both sides will get. Yeah. Finished. Well, I think they were looking at a lot of it. I see it constantly on both Idleberry and. Uh, oh, it's, I'm losing the name of this one here. Oh, okay. Idleberry. No, Cedarberry. 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 Mm -hmm. 
is, uh, I mean, that might be the most uh, California stop, stop sign of, uh, you know, I, I, I constantly watch cars just breathe, you know, I mean, kind of slow down a little bit before they turn right on the Miller Creek Road, but I see that a lot. So to your point, hopefully these bulb outs will create more of an actual stopping mechanism as opposed to, uh, you know, and then I've also heard some concerns from um, the bike community on, you know, safe pathways that these things are actually kind of starting to infringe on the bike lanes and these are, you know, really highly traveled uh, routes for bike commuters and, and, and people who ride a lot. So, I, uh, again, you know, I, I was happy that they were communicative, I was happy that they listened to our concerns, obviously, uh, there's more concerns than just what we brought to them, but I will certainly ask them about the landscaping aspect because we seem to be the default agency. They just expect to maintain these things uh, and that takes time and resource. Just the adjacent neighbor has to water it. Yeah, it's in front of their house. <laughs> it's in front of your house. You put the hose out there. <laughs> Well, yeah, I, actually that house on the corner, I just was watching them try to turn into their own driveway during this, and there was one of the trucks was blocking it, and somebody, they had to get somebody to move the truck just so they could pull into their own driveway to get into their own home right there on that other corner. Uh, it's, uh, their, their foliage is also, I don't know if it's their responsibility again or the counties, but uh, whatever is behind their fence and next to the sidewalk totally obstructs the view com pulling out of cedar bearing going on to Luna Creek. Right. So um, what you consider a California stop, like for example, I have to really go past the sidewalk to, see, to, see, to, to see. stop mm -hmm. so I can see what whether a car is coming or mm -hmm. not. Yeah. And so, um, yeah, but I, I have not found the Department of Public Works very responsive agency to work in possible for them to put in trees that don't require ongoing watering and then just grow into something beautiful in the area that matches some of the other. I mean, because part of when you come down Miller Creek, that area outside of the fire station, we have those beautiful maples that change color in the fall. I mean, it's so gorgeous. I wonder if they could do something like put in some more maple trees that would just kind of then blend with the... Uh, uh, yeah, I, I really honestly have no idea what their plans are. They may have very set plans. I know they took out a couple liquid amber trees. I told them that they were welcome to go up and down the entire sidewalk and remove all of the liquid amber trees <laughs> if they so chose. Uh, but they did inform me that actually next year um, that stretch of Miller Creek Road is set to be repaved. Okay. At which point they'll be doing a lot of work up and down the road and that actually might be a realistic consideration of getting rid of those because uh, you know it impacts the streets. Those roots Nice. Are shallow and they grow right up. And I was also saying, good, when you do that, there's a lot of drainage issues along the gutters here with pooling and standing water that isn't graded or flowing in the right direction. So please uh, engineer a solution for that too. Well, it just moves everything. <laughs> uh, it's, yeah. um, just to add to Luke on a couple of the major projects, we did finish the storm drain repair over in the Park Panhandle area. Um, it is technically still in its curing stage. It takes a full 30 days to cure, but they uh, apply a curing agent that's actually approved by the water board, um, water quality control board uh, for the Bay Area that uh, allows within a matter of, I think, 72 hours that actually water can move through there. So they've already un un uncapped the uh, catch basin. Uh, so water can move back through there, I think, uh, and, and they actually did a really quick, really good, really clean job, and they actually went a little above and beyond on their end in shoring up the end of that pipe where it was coming out, and they said it looked like maybe a little, you know, foxhole or something, uh, uh, not an actual fox, but just where natural erosion had pooled and the weight of the pipe, so they uh, put some more of the grout and everything in there to keep that area shored up. So they did a really good job. I was really impressed with what they did. Um, the uh, DPW land use uh, engineer came down and also said, yeah, this is a good, they did a good job, a good clean job. So our guys are just finishing up on filling those two sinkholes um, and then they'll compact the uh, earth there and the fencing will come down and that ideally should happen, uh, if not this week, then hopefully later early next week. Um, so that little scar will be a noticeable uh, until the next one appears somewhere up or down the creek where the next unknown drain rolls through. Um, 
And then just the brief update on the maintenance shed. Um, I have RF, uh, informal RFPs out through the Marin Builders Association, through the North Coast Builders Exchange in Sonoma County, as well as direct appeals to contractors. We're just trying to get somebody who will come in and uh, install and then subsequently remove story poles for the maintenance facility. That's our only outline requirement. I've had them out there. I pushed them out a second time. I've had one person express some interest. I've received zero proposals on this work so far, and uh, it really needs to be done by a, a, a licensed contractor, not just, this isn't something I would have our park guys go to. Um, it needs to be staked, it needs to be in appropriate places, it needs to clearly uh, identify the edges of the building and the perimeter of the roof line, it needs to have netting up the roof line, the whole nine yards. So, uh, if you know any contractors capable and qualified of doing this work, by all means, the uh, nice thing is, it's a small job that they can probably squeeze in between other jobs. Mm -hmm. The sad thing is, there's more work out there than there are qualified people to do the work, and this is a small job. Yeah. Yeah. It's catch twenty two. So you, are leaning on every resource I know uh, to get this thing done, um, so we can fully satisfy all of those mm -hmm. requirements. And the planning knows, planning knows all all the efforts that we've put forth and all the notices that we've put out there. And, put together a brief informal RFP for it, uh, utilize the plans that uh, Hansel uh, designed put together for us. It's very clear what needs to be done and ideally somebody qualified to come in and do it in another couple of days. And this is for the new leadership? Yep. Okay. Is Earth or anybody? Is that? I already tried that out. <laughs> Trust me, I, I've leaned on every person I can think of. Is the design for that facility approved or where is that? No, that's what we're at. So it is in the design review stage. Putting up these story poles is the final process of it. The application and the documents have been deemed as complete. Uh, they're just waiting for the actual installation of the story poles. It'll go through a notice period as part of that. Uh, and then what next steps occur from there, I'm not totally clear on because I don't think the planning department is 100% clear on it, whether it goes up to the planning commission or not, uh, time will tell. I have a question actually about that facility, and maybe you've answered this already, but where will the um, vehicles turn around after they drive through? Uh, vehicles aren't necessarily going to be driving through. That's the kind of big mis well, that, that's the big mis misnomer. They're not the drive-through is an option that they can have, yeah. if needed, to simply be able to move equipment or material into that bay. The intention is not for the vehicles to be driving through. The intention is for them to be coming into the main area and then coming out of the main area all through that entrance along. Miller Creek. It's not to have them drive through and then turn around in the area where we just fix the culvert. No, no, no. There's a misunderstanding about that. Uh, that's one term for it, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Anything else? All right. Uh, item number seven, uh, request for future agenda items. Can I say anything I didn't write? Just to give you guys one last little update, um, again, I've, and I, I sent out to both commissions uh, as well as the board, um, and we've posted it in multiple places, uh, just looking for potential commissioners to come in. Um, obviously, we have a November meeting. Traditionally, there's not a December meeting. Um, so hopefully we'll have some clarity by November on where we uh, stand in terms of new uh, potential appointments or renewing appointments for uh, those who are coming up uh, whose term will be ending and then uh, be able to make some decisions from there and then the other thing just in terms of future agenda uh, and Luke and I haven't even really talked about this but given what is going to be hopefully um, some level of uh, new commissioners coming on that uh, uh, shortly thereafter you know looking at January most likely uh, getting back into some of these uh, facility and area updates I think uh, seems to make sense with okay we'll have some new people on board what's a good way to introduce them to some of the areas that we do so uh, by all means if you know of people who would be willing to sacrifice a night and serve the community uh, I sent you a copy of the thing you are welcome and encouraged to give them my direct contact information I'm happy to sit down and meet with anybody who might be interested or just has additional questions 
Um, and have, um, can you remind me what kind of process have we established for new commissioners to kind of onboard them? Um, Do you remember? I don't. Well, I don't know that we have a quote unquote formal process because everything at a commission level is kind of intentionally informal. Obviously, like I would use Anne as the most recent yeah. example. Uh, you know, beyond what she stated she was interested in, I mean, her and I sat and met for probably an hour that day, and, you know, giving her a copy of the bylaws, um, you know, showing her where she could find some past minutes uh, and some other things that the commission has done, uh, and just kind of broad scope of the intentions of the commission and the ways that staff uh, certainly looks to the commission for some help and some support. So you're, you're basically doing the heavy lifting in terms of onboarding? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Have you posted the, um, the opening here in the community center? Um, oh, yeah, it's posted right in the main marquee out front. Um, you know, just the, the notice, which is kind of a formal notice. I, I, mm -hmm. I, but, you know, blasted it on next door a couple times. Um, we put it on our Facebook page. Uh, it's obviously on our website in multiple places, including the, the front landing page, the home page, uh, with a little scrolling announcement up top. Uh, it's uh, again, the, and I and I truly believe. I mean, the most effective way of actually recruiting people is through direct appeals. So if you know somebody who you think it would be willing uh, to do this and would be good for the commission and the district, uh, by all means, uh, you get good people by asking good people to to join and participate and serve. So. Mm -hmm. So. Take your future agenda on a tangent there. Right. Apologies. Well, if there are no future agenda items, then I see no reason not to adjourn. Okay. Can I uh, motion? Move to adjourn. Second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Unanimous. Thank you. Good night. Thank you all. Thank you. Enjoy your Halloween.